on the next episode of Sip Suds and Smokes. Today's episode is going to be about coffee and the journey. Well, I can even remember even at the same like Reverend Mark, what, what was it before Hazelnut? And was there life before Hazelnut? Yeah, <laughs> it, was, it was it was vanilla. <laughs> well, really, <I> know. right? <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, going from the amateur to the snob phase, I mean, it's kind of in fits and starts, but, you know, there's always the, you know, the so-called seasonal encounters, uh, you know, with these specialty coffees like the pumpkin spice latte experience that you had, you know, that just sort of uh, jolted you. Into I've actually an- seen T-shirts this year. <laughs> the PSL t shirt PSL T-shirts, yes. <laughs> we'll be right back after this break. live from the dude in the basement studios why because that's where the good stuff is it sips suds and smokes with your smoke and host the good old boys It's sipping time. Hey, welcome to the Sips episode where everything good in life is worth discussing. I am one of your co-hosts here at the table. This is good boy Mike. And joining me here is good boy Scott. Hello. Good old gal Marita. Hello. And Reverend Mark. Hello. Our sip segments are all about wine, distilled spirits, tea, and coffee. And today's episode is going to be about coffee and the journey. We often get that question of, you know, hey, I'm actually starting to enjoy coffee. And what would you suggest next for me, you know, to go and enjoy, you know, so what does the A to B look like, you know, for coffee? So take my hand and we'll lead you to the righteous land of great flavor and experience. No, that's, that's your other hand. That's, but that one's not so sweaty. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you very much. Um, Marina, it's going to tell us all about the way she carves this up. Um, You know, when someone begins a new culinary adventure, I always joke that there are three distinct stages that you move through, um, like the stages of grief or or anything like that. Number one is the amateur stage um, where you really don't know, but you don't know what you don't know. So you're kind of ready for adventure. It's all about discovery, new experiences, honing your skills. um, And you get to approach everything as kind of a wide eyed beginner. That's a that's a really pleasant stage to be in. Um, step two becomes maybe a little less pleasant into, into a snobbery stage where maybe it's more pleasant for you, but it's less pleasant for everyone around you because it's when you start to, to begin acting like a, like an insufferable snob and the things you used to enjoy are now beneath you and impossible for you to stomach. You inwardly or outwardly sneer at people drinking Starbucks. Oh, those poor fools. If only they, if only they knew, um, you enjoy an ego boost of doing it the right way. Um, Whereas so many others are clueless or missing out. Um, Step three, you pass into an acceptance phase. At some point, you you enter the final non-judgmental, almost Buddhist in nature phase where... Um, (laughs) Yes. um, where, where you can you can just kind of relax and not critique what either you're drinking or what someone else is drinking. You TM and coffee could go together, you know, as long as you're just humming the right tone. Right. Yeah. You know, as, as long as you're humming the right tone. I think that's the key. Um but but you know it's that it's that I'm a, I'm sort of above the, the 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 petty differences of coffee drinkers. You know, we're all coffee drinkers here, and um, and you can you can like what you like, and and people can be in other stages without a 
without making you cranky. Um, and you don't need, you don't need to correct people. Um, I, so, I, so I think there's that psychological transformation where, where you sort of enter a space for a while where you see what you drink as some, some aspect of your identity or how much, you know, and, and you're broadcasting that to other people. Um, I mean, coffee is a social beverage. So a lot of times you're drinking it with others, which invites comparison. Um, and it's also very nostalgic. So even, even if you're, you grew up drinking terrible coffee with your, with your dad or your mom at the breakfast table, you taste that again, you're going to have, you're going to enjoy it in a different way. Even if, even if it's not the, the, the most high quality beverage that you're used to. Um, and those, those social and nostalgic moments, they, they can really transcend a, a critical approach to what you're drinking. I mean, most people start drinking, I don't know, coffee out of a, a red can or a blue can that's filled <laughs> with with yeah. Robustas, which are, you know, the low quality coffees that are the non-Arabica, non-specialty gourmet variety. And that could happen in your, your childhood or you remember your grandma brewing coffee out of that blue can. There might be some nostalgia there, but you didn't really know what you were tasting. And you, know, you find that at offices, too, where low quality coffee kind of is uh, has been tolerated i guess or was tolerated you see less of that today but people are just looking for the effect of the the caffeine buzz or i need that wake up cup of coffee in the morning versus hey i really want to enjoy this this moment of uh, of great coffee flavor so yeah i think marina's amateur stage is is well described you know it's when you're you're in the grocery aisle and uh you know you see things like um hazelnut or irish cream or um I saw watermelon coffee once. Starbucks. Yeah, exactly. It was ridiculous. Um, so lots of lots of adulteration and uh, and flavored creamers also seem to be uh, prolific, which is gross. I mean, I've looked and look at the product list or the ingredient list, I should say, in some of those things, and um, it's. Uh, I, I don't think many natural flavors are, are found in many of those items. There is nothing nat natural there. That's that's lab created flavoring. Super, super mm -hmm. nasty. Um, but really, uh, you know, what ends up happening next is that you know your first encounter where you. I remember for me it was in college. It was like, wow, this is espresso. I went to school in Boston, and Boston wasn't a haven for great coffee, but there were a few shops that brewed espresso and it was like okay this is uh i'll start with the uh the training wheels and i'll have a mocha you know which is your the big step basic hot chocolate you yeah, know hot chocolate yeah, with a yeah, little coffee yeah. flavor and over time it was like okay that's too sweet and eventually you know i got to the place where i i enjoyed a cappuccino or something with a little bit more flavor and you know the other thing that we we hear a lot of people admit to openly is they get into their own ruts of like, okay, I like an Americano with half and half and they drink that same thing for 30 years. Um, so I don't know. I, I like variety is cool, but you know, sometimes people want that, that very consistent first cup of whatever they're used to in the morning and certainly nothing wrong with that unless it is a, uh, you know, seven ounces of your favorite Bailey's Irish cream creamer. That's a little, that's a little rough way to start the day. Mm, yeah. Yeah. You know, I remember this phase, you know, for me personally, um, and I'm not afraid to admit what that looked like, you know, um, it was, uh, a lot of drip coffee, you know, in a, you know, just a, <laughs> that brew cycle that you're hearing, you know, all Scott was chatting, I mean, in that dirty coffee pot that you probably never cleaned I out never cleaned for the first out. 15 years of coffee. <laughs> I would have to say that I was very guilty of flavored coffees. I would, you know, uh, hazelnut flavored was absolutely the way to go. And I remember actually going after like 15 different. My goal was to get the very best hazelnut flavored coffee on the free planet. And I remember that I would, you know, buy like five different, you know, brands and bags. And I remember I settled in on a Kona blend. So you were a snob around hazelnut coffee. Yeah. Well, I can Hazel get that snob. way about, I, you know, I do this with bread. So, you know, it's like, look, if you're going to have bread, have the very best bread. So, you know, it's it's more of a personality disorder that I just happen to do this with coffee <laughs> that I would do it with everything else. Um, but, you know, I remember that the the rite of passage or the way that I would even describe the way I was enjoying coffee then was cool 
uh, you know, I start each day with four cups of coffee. You know, it was just this very interesting way of how I was marking um, what was a successful, and I, I'm quoting that, you know, in the air, uh, it was the number of good cups of coffee, you know, that I had that day. Right. Yeah. What's the phase, though, before amateur? I'm thinking, you know, my, my own life experience with coffee when I was uh, in my early teens and was running a paper route and I'd have to get up early in the morning. And of course, this was like in the early 70s and uh, in the south, you know, at the at the local uh, restaurant where I stopped uh, for coffee and got literally hooked on coffee. It, it was more about the experience of the caffeine and they had both kinds of coffee there. They had Maxwell house and Folgers. Um, and so it was just, wow, I like this, but it was, it was like, it, it, it allowed me to um, kind of motor through the rest of the day at school because it's a utility drink. It's a yeah, tool. It was a, it's not, exactly. it's not a culinary experience. Totally yeah. Effect. yeah. Not, not at all. Right. Not at all. Not at all. So I, 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 so that was prior to even the amateur phase of my life. It was just, yeah, it was a utility drink. I mean, I think you have to step on the train like that's like you're not even you haven't <laughs> left the station yet. If, if that's your experience with coffee. And I think like the journey starts when you realize there's more to coffee and, and you start right. to you start to, to begin that journey. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I can even remember uh, even at the same, you know, maybe even, you know, like Reverend Mark, what, what was it before Hazelnut? And even as we were talking was about their you, life before hazelnut, yeah, <laughs> it, was, it was, it was vanilla. <laughs> well, really, no, right? <laughs> no, but it was, you know, it was purely for effect. And I mean, we're down now we're down into, you know, fully, you know, recirculated coffee in a percolator. Right. Mm. So Reverend Mark and I spent a lot of time at a lot of uh, youth summer camps. And, you know, that was the diehard device that you move through a lot of those experiences. You're in a remote setting. You know, it's not like you're going to go down to any local coffee shop or anything like that. And I really remember even through that period of time that the effect of caffeine really took, you know, strong hold of me and to the point where. I was drinking a, a full pot a day, you know, and um, I think that that was there was something that went off in my head um, that said, hey, I don't think that the caffeine that you're enjoying is a good thing for you in quantity. And I remember actually getting to the point where I had went cold turkey and said, you know what, I need to just back off from this. And uh, there was something that just said, hey, this this is not good for you. Well, look, everyone goes through a drugs phase and uh, when they're young, yeah, <laughs> caffeine is a drug phase. Well, I, if I had to go yeah. through a drug phase, caffeine was a good choice. Is that what you're saying? I mean, it's it's no worse than the other. Yeah, Reverend Mark's going, yeah. man, she did well, the weed no, no, no. phase, man. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> good. You're still going to see those new colors. You know, you drink enough cups of, cool. enough cups of what you got. But I, but I was able to, I was able to power through graduate school mostly uh, with with caffeine and, uh, and cigarettes. So, Hey, we'll be right back after this break. Hey, welcome back to Sip, Suds, and Smokes. On today's episode, we're actually talking about a journey with coffee. Oh, boy! You know, kind of what does this look like uh, as you're starting to enjoy coffee and kind of what is the A to B, you know, enjoying coffee kind of looks like. So we started off our discussion here talking about uh, the amateur stage, or I like to call it the percolator phase. <laughs> so, yeah, look at them. They're all like, uh huh, yeah, I know that goes, Mike. I see that. Um, so, you know, it's it is so. Uh, rather interesting you know some of the choices that you make through this but the you know the way we kind of close it out the rut is a very real thing and i think it is a combination of the addictive nature you know that caffeine can really have on you and i think just the aversion from a a human you know perspective of saying i really don't want to make any decisions before 9 a.m you know it just um, I think there's just a lot of people that, you know, they just 
they want things to be in repetition, you know? So I think both of those. Can- well, specialty coffee is, uh, is also relatively new. Like you go back just a couple decades and you just, everybody just drank the same type of coffee. You know, we didn't have like the endless options, the, the single origins, the, the artisan coffee shops on every corner, you know, like your, your options were limited and, and coffee was sort of more like coffee. It just came out of the pot with Maxwell House versus Folgers, it didn't really make much of a difference. So, so I think that the coffee was very much sort of a rut um, before before it had this this explosion that we've seen within within the specialty coffee world. Mm-hmm. Mm. Well, think about beer too. I mean, it's like you go to places, especially on the West Coast, and it's not like do you have an IPA? It's like you have to listen to some numb nuts talk about seventy five <laughs> different <laughs> seventy five different IPAs that they have, and which you know the international yeah. business units of each one. It's so the choices are, are kind of endless in the coffee arena too. Oh yeah, for sure. And I do. Uh, I was. I was gonna say we we all started out talking about college, like drinking coffee during college. And I think that when you're young, then there's some adult. There's there's something adult about drinking coffee. And so at some point you decide like, oh, I'm I'm grown up enough to drink coffee. You have to be like really tough to drink like that that dark black, you know, black coffee straight. And it it becomes almost a part of a part of kind of ascending into adulthood. Get your first job. You got to get up. You got to drink the coffee. Um, and it, it sort of it becomes an, a part of that transitional phase. So uh, Reverend Mark's going to tell us a little bit about, you know, what is the next step on this journey here? Yeah, well, you know, going uh, bef- between the uh, or from the amateur to the snob phase, I mean, it's kind of in fits and starts. But, you know, there's always the, you know, the so-called seasonal encounters, uh, you know, with these specialty coffees like the pumpkin a uh, spice latte experience that you had, you know, that just sort of uh, jolted you. Into I've actually an- seen t-shirts this year. <laughs> the PSL yeah. t-shirt. PSL t-shirts. Yes, I really right. have. It's like, what is PSL? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, you know, and then you, you go to the first origin experience, uh, you know, where, you know, it's usually uh, due to lack of experience and you just pump it, you go, but you know, that's, you're, you're getting, you know, uh, a little bit uh, more of, a uh, you know, a, a refined sense of, you know, this is different than what I've had before. Why is that? Um, and then there's that time where you have a recognition of the flavor elements of coffee and the Americana that's unadulterated. And it's usually, of course, due to the fact that there was no sugar or milk available to you. Uh, so, you know, you're you're in a place of, of learning. Uh, now, for me, you know, it really did get down to it one time. And this was more in the like the mid nineties when we had, uh, you know, a, a roast, a, a local roaster come about, uh, that I actually did get to know one of the first baristas in our town and, uh, that, uh, that he started making recommendations about, uh, you know, trying new kinds of, uh, single origin coffees. Um, Oh, you were ahead of the curve. If you were doing that in the nineties, you were right on trend. Yeah, this this was in the mid nineties. And, and actually I was, I was trading with him, um, uh, biscottis that what I was making because it was just kind of a stand up counter. And so he, he had a little glass, you know, jar that, uh, he would put my biscotti in and I would come usually on Monday mornings with some biscotti and he would trade out with me on some of his coffee. And he also showed me how to make an espresso, you know, with the, like the, the way you did the quarter turn and all that. It was pretty cool so you know i kind of just kind of just just sort of uh (laughs) stumbled into that mike's over there making his own espresso (laughs) (laughs) get that milk right sound so such a lovely (laughs) so so then you know what it comes down to is that this you 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 make your your purchase of your first whole bean coffee at a shop and then you get the grinder you know you get the grinder um and you make your americana at home um and so at this point rule number two sets in and that you make the same the the same origin americana for years you know because (laughs) we're we're creatures of habit so that's sort of the way the cycle goes so i think when you get to that that next enlightened phase if you will uh, of acceptance that, uh, you know, is kind of like the, again, a Buddhist term, beginner's mind. You're coming kind of back to, you know, sort of simplicity on the far side of complexity. I like that. 
Well, I think that rut, you know, can definitely be something that you feel like you leave and then you come back, you know? And so I was talking a little bit about, you know, this moment I had where caffeine really had, you know, pronounced itself as, Hey, this is, you know, not in this quantity, it doesn't work for you really well. Um, but I think coming back, you know, at, at this point, um, the one moment that I remember very pronounced was, and that was the scenario is that I was in a coffee shop. I definitely wanted something that was fairly quick. They had a Colombian, you know, that was in the daily and I just got a pump, you know, from their daily uh, thermos and there was no milk or sugar even available. And I had it, you know, straight up. And I, I remember very profoundly, it was about halfway through that cup and I'm like, wow, this is really good, man. I like this, you know, straight up with no milk, no sugar, no flavor, no nothing. Yeah. So do any of you remember that point of epiphany where you, you ran across uh, this unadulterated, you know, experience with coffee and, and you were like, wow, is this really what this is supposed to taste like? One of my first encounters with a, a, a different exotic coffee, it, it certainly wasn't very good. I, I don't think looking back was in right right when i got out of high school so this was in the 70s i went to the middle east and had turkish coffee Mm -hmm. so what's what's that what's in turkish coffee yeah usually there's a couple things in turkish coffee one is the the preparation method with the kind of multiple boiling stuff Mm -hmm. is is unusual and then um that coffee is the home for there's a really bad tasting flavor defect called rio (laughs) that you find it in, in Brazil. And it's almost very, it almost tastes like chemical, like, like bleachy kind of chlorine. And you find that in a lot of Turkish coffee too, but really good Turkish coffee. I mean, it used to be stuff from, from Yemen, those mocha coffees, but Mm, okay. Uh huh. Over time it became something a little bit different. So I don't know. I've got a buddy I play in a band with who is uh, Lebanese and um, he always wants to brew me coffee, his style. And he's like, how is this really as a taster? And I was like, it's like man because it's it's <laughs> you know it's got that defect it tastes like the underlying i mean I, my training is to taste coffee for a living this is literally what i do and you know it's a major defect when you find that that chemical flavor in coffee and all the coffees that he had in these bags that were expensive were were like that i mean it's yeah. funny to think that one man's defect is like another man's like like flavor explosion yeah yeah yeah, uh, yeah. one man's trash is another man's treasure uh, yeah, it's crazy. Anyway. Oh, yes. Yeah, Scott was just telling us about his uh, trip west. Tell us about your trip out west, Scott. Yeah, so I remember the first time really that I sort of had that that light switch go on of now I'm really drinking kind of big boy coffee. I moved to the Bay Area and uh, discovered Pete's Coffee and Tea, which Alfred Pete um, ended up years later being a mentor of mine I was lucky to work with. But Pete's Coffee in the early days was, you know, dark roast, really the beginning of West Coast, dark style coffee, the Italian style of coffee. And I remember going to a Pete store and just drinking a cup of drip. And I was like, wow, I have to really put a lot of cream in here to even get used to the way this tastes. And I remember it was a point of pride of mine, like, okay, I'm going to get a cup of Pete's drip. I think it was Major Dickinson's blend or one of those. And I'm like, I'm not going to put any milk in this. And I was like, wow, I've reached, you know, I've reached my coffee adulthood now. And it took, <laughs> took some time, man. And it's not like I was dumping in 10 packs of sugar before that. But that dark roast coffee brewed, you know, brewed properly was, was, was a, you know, a real awakening for me. Yeah, my um, I didn't I didn't start to, to think about coffee differently. I lived in New York City for a while. It was just diner coffee. All the way mm. down. <laughs> no, nothing else. Um, and uh, and of course, I put cream and sugar in it. And uh, and when I moved to Seattle, I was in that that glorious flavored creamer phase. Um, and uh, and so I, I didn't. I, I I had an inkling I should be buying better coffee if I lived in Seattle, just because of the reputation of the city. Um, and so I would go out of my way to, um, to try to find good coffees, but then I would bring them home and I would brew them and I would put my flavored creamer in them. So, so, <laughs> sure. you know, I didn't, I didn't think like, oh, I should be drinking this differently. I thought it was a quality thing. I should be drinking better quality coffee. Uh, but that didn't necessarily carry through to, I should be appreciating something or a really good flavored creamer. <laughs> yeah. Right. High end flavored creamer. Right. <laughs> 
Uh, so, so it was, um, it were the, it was those moments where, um, where I, maybe I was running out of creamer or I was like in a rush or I forgot, or I had people over or something. And, um, and I realized that there was, um, there was something else here to what I was drinking that was, that was making it easy. Cause I didn't picture myself as somebody who likes black coffee. Like, I don't want to suffer through my coffee. I, I don't have, I don't have anything to prove. Um, I'm, I, you know, I'm not like a journalist. I'm not in one of these hard boiled professions where I'm like sucking down the black coffee every day. Like I want to enjoy it. And I, and I didn't think black coffee was enjoyable. And, um, and it, it was, um, it's at some point I sort of weaned myself off of the creamer. Maybe it, maybe I went through a phase where I don't want to drink as much sugar or, um, I was focusing on fitness, but it was, I, I think it was those having those quality beans beneath it all, um, and realizing very slowly that there was something there. I think that was my, that was my eye-opening experience. Um, I remember getting into a very heated discussion with a friend that it seemed like it lasted well over an hour about whether having hazelnut flavored coffee was better than having hazelnut flavored creamer and which mm. one actually, you know, was providing the desired effect. And uh, you could always add both together for like a double, <laughs> double hazelnut, extreme. hazelnut extreme. Like, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. The acceleration <laughs> into the bottom was just so happening so hard and fast. And looking back at it, it's like, really, you know, is that an hour of life that I can get back now? Dump uh, some amaretto in there for a triple. There you triple go. Red. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. Complete the nightmare <laughs> uh, for sure. Um, but, you know, there are these brief moments, you know, probably through this phase where you're enjoying, you know, that unadulterated element, you know, of of a particular coffee. And it's, you know, moving from that point of uh, it happening by happenstance, which is the way I described it. You know, I just was in the situation where there was no milk and sugar um, and then choosing that uh, and saying, wow, you know, I want that once again, I just, can I just have like a cup with, with nothing in it and everybody staring at me going, wait, so you're not getting any pumps of any flavors. No, I'm just having it straight up, man. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. My journey with coffee went in a completely new and exciting direction uh, on a literal journey uh, in the mid 1980s, when I was still in in really fairly new in parish ministry, and I was working with a, a missions group, and we would do uh, medical and uh, construction work uh, in different parts of the world, and so for like three years running, uh, I would spend anywhere from uh, two weeks to a month in Panama. And so we wound up going uh, into the the, the western uh, end of uh, of the isthmus, up in near Costa Rica, and on the weekends we would get to kind of tool around, go to different places, and we went to this place called Boquete, and uh, it was just amazing. There there were a lot of uh, you know just coffee uh, farms there, and I had never encountered anything like that. And I got to see how it was how it was processed, and uh, and they were roasting it fresh. And I had their coffee, and I said, "This is like nothing I've ever had before in my life." And I wound up buying, I remember, twenty pounds of it, <laughs> and putting it in my uh, duffel bag, and putting it under my cot, and I could smell it all night long. It was beautiful, uh, but but really, I started thinking differently about coffee just on that journey. And, you know, part of it was maybe I associated with the taste of it, which was very, um, you know, there were some layered tastes in there that I'd never gotten out of just my regular cup of joe. But uh, also the connection to it being from a fairly exotic part of the world. But it was also freshly roasted as well. And so this, again, this is like circa 1985, 1986. So that's sort of when I took a different, you know, sort of, point of or you know i started going in a different direction with how i thought about coffee yeah Mm. yeah that's cool mark i i've been to that area of panama it's fantastic cherokee province and uh and bouquetti is is a beautiful part of the coffee world yeah very very um lesser known than than it once was unfortunately yeah well, let me talk about uh, kind of the next steps. And so there's going to be that moment that the coffee maker breaks. 
and you're going to make the leap into making espresso at home. It's going to be the worst espresso machine ever that you will ever buy. So it's like, you know, why does this espresso taste so bad at home? And you're going to have, you know, more encounters with the barista that we're calling barista number two. You're going to start, you know, making lattes at home. And then, you know, then you're going to find that lattes at home are not as good as the lattes at the coffee shop. And, you know, you're also going to find that the Americano that you're making at home is not as good as the latte. You know, Imagine that those professional baristas know what they're doing. Yep. Hey, we'll be right back after this break. Hey, welcome back to your Sips, Suds, and Smokes. On today's Sips episode, we're talking about coffee. <laughs> um, we're also talking about a journey with coffee. And uh, I was just kind of talking about, you know, you're having all these moments where you're making espresso at home. <laughs> which is- I was like, what's that sound? <laughs> <laughs> Trains off the tracks. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, the thing is, is that you all of a sudden you have this you know challenge that you are going to go toe to toe with a coffee shop and you're going to make it a good espresso at home. And plus, you know, at middle age and then some more money comes into the play and then all of a sudden you're like, I'm going to buy the big machine. I'm going to spend a thousand bucks on an espresso machine. <laughs> So, because you're like, you know, as long as I'm spending a super amount of money, you know, I mean, how many people are not doing the math? They're like, how how many cups of coffee at a coffee shop that are made correctly, you know, with probably a twenty thousand dollar machine, you know, that you're going to go toe to toe with at home. It also becomes a hobby. It's like buying the Mm -hmm. fancy stand mixer or any other sort of kitchen gadget. At that point, you want to be sort of a home aficionado. So uh, you wind up with a semi-automatic coffee machine that makes, you know, they have a decent steaming wand about it, you know, and you're, it's proudly sitting there in your kitchen like you just had a fresh kill. <laughs> so, <laughs> and when you walk everybody in your kitchen, you're like, this is my kitchen, but this is my espresso machine. You know, it's like, <laughs> you know. You don't even introduce your children first. You point out the espresso machine to people when they walk in. Man. And you offer to make everybody a, a, a cup. Like I, you're, you're cleaner. Some the person who comes to walk your dog. Yeah. <laughs> I've made a great dinner, but hey, can I make you some something out of my super fancy, you know? Yeah. Who wants a cup? Who wants yeah. espresso? Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> the snob phase is really fully entrenched at this point. And you're no longer asked the question of like, you know, how's your coffee? It's clearly evolved into looking over the rim of your cup and asking, Hey, what origin are you drinking today? <laughs> I literally just asked Scott that question. <laughs> <laughs> so you're still finding out that the latte at home still is less, you know, than the latte right. at the coffee shop. And, oh, I need to clean that after every drink that's made. Hmm, okay. So you're going to be blaming the fact that it's not as good as a coffee shop on beans, on water, on technique, on your spouse, on temperature. You're going to watch 47 different YouTube classes on making the perfect latte. <laughs> that's when that's when the tipping point usually comes in. So if your YouTube watching counter is above 20, seek help. Okay. <laughs> you're just not going to go well. And now you're into talking with barista number three, which at this point, you're going to enroll in a barista class online. This is this is the other bell that goes off in your head. If the you're barista class online. <laughs> you're doing a barista <laughs> class online to make the perfect latte. There should be a bell that goes off in your head. You're buying 20 different espresso blends from every local source that you can find. I mean, it's like, you know, hey, I'm, I don't even know how to cup anything, you know, and they're just, they've got espresso just lined up, you know, going all the way down the, down the kitchen counter. They're making, they're making like 15 different espressos. I'm going to find the perfect one, you know, so um, they meet a friend who has a home roaster and I have a story about that. So, you know, where has this been my whole life? 
and you meet that friend in quotes every month for a fresh bag of whatever they're roasting, you leave your spouse, your girl, girlfriend, your boyfriend, your parents, your children, your job, and you camp out at the coffee roaster's friend's backyard. This is like a total fantasy where it's like the roaster is like the hot guy. Oh, right. In or this the hot case, girl. And you're just like, that's who everybody wants to be. I get to blame somebody sitting right here with us. It's Reverend Mark. So <laughs> <laughs> he is well, his, his first generation, you know, of roasting was just a, a cafe gin. It was like a half a cup, you know, uh, module that was uh, that that he used just literally had a crank dial on the side of it, you know, like an egg it timer. Was a, it was a glorified popcorn pop. It was air, air popcorn. Yeah. But I think the most profound thing that I tell everybody that comes over and now I have neighbors that are in such close proximity to me and they know what's going on that they know when I'm roasting and they're like, Oh, Mike's Mike's roasting the good stuff. Mm -hmm. And they're like, just casually walking over like, Hey, Hey neighbor, how's it going? You know? And I'm like, where are you coming from? (laughs) Hey, you have like a half a pound you can spare me. I'm like, you know, I got like three dime bags, but you know, for a 20, but what's it going to do for you, man? (laughs) So, but the most profound thing that I tell everybody, and I, this is, this has stayed with me now for over 30 years. I I'm like, okay, listen, here's the deal. I will give you some of my home roast, but this is what's going to happen. You're going to go home. You're going to have this. It is going to be the very best coffee that you've had in your free adult life. And every cup of coffee that you have after this that is not from a home roaster is going to taste like crap. So as long as you're prepared for that point of grand epiphany, I will share some of my coffee with you, man. And Those I'm are pretty you, high expectations. Right. Is that it is, right. it yeah. is held true for so long. Even the crap. You know, I've probably done some of the worst roasts in my life and I've shared it, you know, with other people. But they're like, oh, man, this stuff rocks the house. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, whatever. <laughs> but mm. I, I still am on the fence. I don't know whether to thank or blame Reverend Mark for that moment, you know, because it's very true. Because every cup of coffee I had after that was just like, wow, this is crap. You know, I just can't even stand this. Yeah, we were stumbling into ecstasy together. That's for sure. And, uh, you know, we were, oh, we were staring at the catalogs, you know, of all the green beans. You know, we're like, I want that. Let's try that. Let's try that. Let's try that. And, you know, I think Mark burned through like, two or three roasting machines with this little, you know, half cup capacity at the time. They didn't last six months. No. (laughs) Yeah. It was pretty wild. So Marina was going to tell us what is the next stumbling point in this journey? All right. So once you've, uh, once you've jumped into the home roasting game, that's uh, that's a whole journey of itself. Um, You might discover your first copying event at a local roaster Tuesday night at 8 PM. You start thinking of roasting, doing the math, grand delusions of coffee roasting as a side hustle sneak in. <laughs> yeah, you start you start just kind of decorating your own cafe, right? Just like in your mind. Yeah. Uh, you, <laughs> what you are you going to call plan. it? You got a business yeah, what plan. Are you gonna... <laughs> just just needs, to, just needs to be looked over just a little bit. You know what color your apron, the aprons your baristas are going to be wearing, but Absolutely. you're not quite sure what yes. your uh, coffee is going to be. Uh, so you might fir- purchase your first Gen Cafe hot air roaster popcorn popper. Uh, you burn your first five batches to a crisp, but declare Absolutely. that first batch under roasted, <laughs> sour, not good. Uh, you join five coffee roaster Facebook groups, declare to everyone that <laughs> you're a coffee roaster by, by doing your first batch of maybe five pounds of green beans which seems like a lot like who buys five pounds of coffee in one go like if you got five pounds like your pantry is stacked um you vow never to buy flavored creamer flavored coffee robusta ground coffee or coffee from a grocery store ever again you alternate buying single origins espresso blends and home roasting you might discover the gesha and camp out at a local roaster for your first five pound bag for five hundred dollars uh, declaring to everyone that you have discovered the ultimate coffee. Oh, <laughs> I know, where's the angel singing <laughs> sound effect? <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't know who's home roasting a gasha. That's a, that's a really brave 
That's a brave way to waste some money. Uh, <laughs> yes, that is very true. I, I, I did it last week. I've done that. Yes, just recently. Yeah. <laughs> um, present company excluded in Scott's case, of course. I would trust him to roast any gasha, anytime, anywhere. Thanks, Using Maria. a skillet on a stove. Went from first crack to burnt in like 15 seconds. Yeah, it's an yeah. expensive mistake. <laughs> You're going to burn that gasha in your home roaster. Unbelievable. Um, then you're going to discover your Gasha pour over at your local micro roaster. And you're going to realize that everything that they do is better than what you're doing. Yeah. Um, that's, that's going to be a hard, a hard revelation to swallow. So you might enter coffee rehab and drink tea for 30 days, vowing to leave coffee behind and never drink it again. At some point you're going to need that sip and, and you're going to start up the cycle again. Yeah. Hopefully that doesn't happen too, too often, but, but it could. Um, so there you have it from snob to acceptance or <laughs> sometimes defeat. If you find yourself drinking the green tea, um, just to summarize a little bit, here's a couple of common detours or, or mistakes for lack of a better word that, uh, that come up as we think about this topic. So if you're sticking with the same bean or coffee prep, same process for extended periods of time, um, you know, you're, you're limiting yourself really to uh, to what's out there in the coffee world. There's actually something like 30 million people involved with uh, with coffee production. And I don't know how many farms there are, but but most farms are, are small and most coffee is grown by small holders. So there's a world of, of opportunity and excitement out there for you to check out uh, in the coffee space. Um, another thing is, uh, you know, treat yourself. Really, coffee is not that expensive unless we're talking about these super rare geishas. Um, you're chasing price and not quality can be can be an error. Um, if we're, yep. we're spending a lot of money on something, it must be better. Well, that's not always the case. Uh, coffee, like most products that are you know that are grown and, and agriculturally produced, have huge supply and demand issues, and those often have a, a big factor on pricing. I mean, you think about some of the islands coffees and Jamaica Blue Mountain and some of the Kona's, perfectly interesting coffees. I would challenge anyone who says those are the best coffees in the world to take a little trip to. Uh, the Ethiopian section of their favorite local roaster and see what's available there for about a fraction of that price. And, you know, I have to say it, unfortunately, but, you know, those of us who've had the, the pleasure in quotes of, of trying Kopi Luwak or uh, elephant dung coffee, it's, those, <laughs> those are, those are super novel things that maybe everyone should taste in their coffee journey once. But, um, you know, it, I guess in that case, the, the rarity or the beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Um, but, you know, those things are, are, are sought. And, uh, you know, that little sound effect remind, reminds me, uh, you know, please sip the coffee. Enjoy yourself. Um, you know, it's not meant for gulping unless uh, unless I don't know what, unless you really can't wake up or something like that. But um Less can be more. And, you know, really the last thing, and we've all kind of made little comments about it, but on the adjuncts or the additive and the your friendly neighborhood condiment bar, if God intended coffee to be adulterated with milk and sugar, there'd probably be a dairy cow and a sugar cane field located right next to the coffee plant, which we know there isn't. Um, little analogy to the, you know, the sipping world in, in spirits. If you've ever had whiskey without ice, um, you know, you're experiencing flavor in a way that that ice cube just kind of numbs the taste buds and uh, blocks half the flavor from really ever, ever having the olfactory wonder that is uh, beneath the ice cube. Yeah. It's kind of like what uh, said about if God had intended you to filter your beer, he wouldn't have given you a liver. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this is, Kind of what uh, a coffee journey, you know, can look like kind of um, when you think about what does it look like A to B? And it's interesting. I found myself, you know, at having, you know, interesting moments, you know, through this entire process and thinking, oh, yeah, I was definitely at that stage. I mean, I'm I'm probably if I'm guilty of being in any rut right now, it's um, definitely in that home roaster stage. And and I'm halfway in between that and kind of moving on because there is definitely an, an awful lot of control that you have, you know, when, and it's the illusion of control and quality when you're roasting, you know, on your own. And I don't think you're giving yourself enough time to, how would this same bean taste, you know, if somebody else roasted it. And uh, I think that that is the one thing I find myself skipping out on probably the most right now is saying, 
am I really picking the right roasting profile for this bean? I don't really have the time to go through, you know, five different batches to really find the optimal point, you know, for that. I think what I find amazing about the coffee journey in itself is, is realizing how many, how many folks on, on their coffee journeys are on, on different stages of journeys with other things, right? So you, so you can run into people who are, are very passionate about something like wine or spirits or beer. They know every craft, you know, distillery between here and 100 miles away. And yet they're still drinking Folgers. I'm raising my hand very guilty. <laughs> you, I mean, you'd think that an appreciation for one would would sort of cross over, but I think everyone stumbles into these things at, at different times in their lives, or or while they're while they're really geeking out over one thing, they really want the comfort of the other the other type of food or drink that they just they they feel they feel comfortable in that rut, and that's okay. Um, and and I think that the the, the hopefully the the coffee journey inspires a manner of other journeys within the culinary world or the beverage world. And you can kind of trade those tasting skills back and forth. Yeah. Well, there you have uh, kind of what uh, our coffee journey, you know, sounds like, listen, this was kind of our take and really thinking about how to, you know, how do we answer this, you know, for other people. And, uh, you know, I think everybody's journey can definitely, you know, be very different. A lot of it is a matter of, you know, what parts of this journey do you even have the opportunity or that you're even exposed to? I mean, you may live in a place where the nearest coffee shop is 20 minutes away from wherever you live, you know? So that may have some influence, you know, specifically on what your journey actually will look like, or, you know, what going from A to B, you know, maybe it's look like. So the one story I didn't tell, hopefully I can get this in real quick here in the next 30 was uh, I actually took a, I had this habit of always taking roasted coffee with me on the weekend when I would, you know, be on a plane and going to some other part of the planet. And I would put that, you know, bag of coffee right in my briefcase. Let's just say that I got upgraded at first class an awful lot just because of how good <laughs> my, my luggage mm -hmm. smelled. So, yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> Well, thanks for joining us again for this episode about uh, Coffee Journey. I look forward to your own stories about what this looks like for you. I want to thank my co-host for being here for this discussion. Good old boy, Scott. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, everybody. Keep on roasting in the free world. Good old gal, Marina. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. If uh, if any of your listeners are interested in their own coffee tastings at home, uh, you can visit my company Beanbox at beanbox.com. Uh, you can also find our coffees in the coffee section at select Walmarts across the country. Reverend Mark, thanks for joining us. Yes, and blessings for the continued journey. Hey, this is good old boy Mike asking you to come back. Join us for another exciting episode of Sip, Suds, and Smokes. And I'll ask you to keep on sipping. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you're listening to us online, do yourself a favor and tap. Just tap it in. The subscribe button. Give it a little tappy. Tap, tap, tap a room. The easiest way to listen to our show is to ask Siri, Alexa, Google, Uncle Larry, or whoever it is that talks to you on your phone. Play podcast Sip, Suds, and Smokes. We love your feedback, and you can reach us at info at sipsudsandsmokes.com. Our tasting notes flow out on Twitter and Instagram with our handle at Sip Suds and Smokes, and our Facebook page is always buzzing with lots of news. You'll also be able to interact with the thousands, millions, and millions of other fans on those social media platforms. Do us a favor, take the time to rate this episode if you're listening to us online. That's a big help to us, and we get to see your feedback as well. Come back, join us for another episode. And keep on sipping. Tan Hand production of Sip, Suds, and Smokes, a program devoted to the appreciation of some of the finer slices of life. 
from the dude in the basement studios, your hosts, the good old boys, will see you all next time. <laughs> <laughs>